Good morning, everyone. Um, welcoming you here to our panel um, discussing managing and cooling and warming in our cities. We have a really impressive um, selection of panel speakers today that they're going to share their recent works and some of the uh, relevance that it has to um, using different data sets, um, different methodologies, geoinformation and so on uh, for managing um, cooling and warming in, in cities. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with our first speaker, Professor Priya uh, Rajagopalan, um, who is the Director of Sustainable Building Innovation Lab. Um, and she is a building scientist and has extensive experience in energy and indoor environmental quality and building, um, urban climatology and urban, urban um, thermal balance. So um, Priya, thank you for um, joining us on this panel. The floor is yours. Uh, we would like to hear more about your projects on this topic. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Nick I'll just start sharing my screen so you can see my screen. Are you able to see, see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. And in this presentation, I'm going to discuss um, citizen science in urban microclimate research. So one of the project we have been working on since last two, three years. So, so as you all know, citizen science is public engagement scientific research in collaboration with uh, professional scientists. And the interaction with scientists and citizens allow for public education and engagement in science and research to increase the awareness of problems that affect communities. And uh, for researchers, what is the benefit is basically to collect more data and more meaningful observations, which they are not able to do on their own. So uh, traditionally, citizen science, particularly in Australia, have been um, focusing on ec ecology, uh, like tracking tracking different species, declining species, but their application in built environment is very limited. So this project actually gives some opportunity for trying innovations in science, particularly sensor technology, Internet of Things, etc., in the built environment. So probably yeah, you, you uh, heard about all the uh, issues with number of extreme hot days increasing and um, how it is actually impacting public health, mortality rates, energy demand and economy. And the main research, uh, the main aim of this project is to actually work with local councils and citizens. So normally uh, there is a big gap between like how researchers work, how citizens work and how the governments and local um, lo local governments work. So in this project, we are trying to bring them all together. So everybody actually on the same page and they're addressing the issue which is being faced by everyone. And the results will provide data required for citizens to understand and mitigate and adapt to extreme health. So most importantly, through data collection and participation, citizens will be empowered to respond to extreme health through an understanding of the influencing factors. So as part of this project, we have worked with 22 councils across Australia and uh, representing the whole geographic and climatic ranges in Australia. And we, we have a representation from um, five, six states, including Victoria, New South Wales, um, Northern Territory. So, so we, we're covering, um, essentially covering all climatic areas and we have developed a lot of kits uh, to train citizens so the first part of the project is actually training citizens to uh, use this equipment uh, very simple handheld equipment which can monitor temperature humidity uh, radiant temperature uh, wind speed uh, surface temperature etc so in, in the next level of this uh, equipment, we have high precision sensors, uh, four of them actually installed in different locations, two in New South Wales and two in Victoria. So the idea for these sensors is actually how 
when you collect citizens collect data using the local sensors and how they can actually compare that with uh, high precision sensors which is basically representing undisturbed area uh, some of them in rural settings some of them in an urban settings but mo mostly in undisturbed areas and we, we have uh, provided um, various training in training um, documents for the citizens for before they actually come and start the experiment. So they come to a selected local area, which is uh, suggested by the local councils, depending on what their priority area. It could be an urban open space. It could be a park, which most of the people use. And uh, citizens, after watching the video and uh, getting to know what, what is actually involved in the experiments, they come and gather. And we have actually conducted at least uh, 50 to 70 different experiments all, all over last two years during the summer in Australia. And uh, we, we give them information about you know, where they should be measuring. It could be measuring on the pavement, measuring on the asphalt road, and measuring on the roof of a house and see what the difference they will be looking at. And some experiments, some um, images of what people are actually using this data and how, how they are actually measuring this. And uh, the results are basically presented to them as local climate maps in uh, different locations and how the difference in temperatures uh, between the location and the undisturbed area is presented. So the next stage is where basically what's quite um, applicable for this conference is how collecting this data using a uh, local sensor and an app, which is specifically designed for this project. And uh, people, we, we send these sensor kits and the um, uh, instrument to everyone who registered after the first stage of the face-to-face -face interaction. And uh, they given clear instructions. And this app is actually available both in iOS and Android versions. And what they can uh, select, like what kind of experimental setup, uh, for example, the type of area, including high density, high density residential, uh, if it is in the backyard, and um, whether it is representing industrial area, commercial area, green area, etc., and also whether it is uh, in a park, car park, sidewalk, road. Also, if there are any special features, which is basically, you know, the metadata, the data collected without metadata is not really useful. So we need to know what kind of surface, what kind of um, cloudy, sunny conditions, and the type of wind also has got very uh, important um, applications on the type of data collected. And uh, they can the, the each sensor actually um, coded to the G GPS location. And um, you, once you can confirm the location, we know the census is actually located in this particular um, site, where, 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 whether it is in Victoria, Melbourne, whether it is in Darwin, or anywhere. So once the data is collected, so usually people do like a 24-hour experiment, and they can um, also select uh, reference stations which we have installed as part of the uh, project. In, in addition, they can also connect to any Bureau of Meteorology uh, weather stations. So depending on where they are located, if they are in the Western Australia, they can choose whatever is the um, location very close to their um, the precinct they are in. So the results are actually provided in compar comparative graphs. For example, you know, the red color is actually showing the sensor data and the other two blue and yellow color is actually showing the reference stations or it could be the Bureau of Meteorology stations. So people can actually understand how the humidity is changing or how the temperature is changing and how it is in comparison to an undisturbed area. And um, this information is made available through the website. So what you can see here is people can select uh, the sensors uh, depending on what, what is the sensor ID and also the date and time and the area type which is uh, entered previously in the um, experimental state and special features. And you can uh, see how the geolocation in, uh, in the map 
and all, all uh, capability for zooming, etc. And also, this is how, if you really want to map out, you know, how different sensors at different locations during a particular time, how they are um, basically compared against each other. And thank you very much for listening. Um, so these are the project groups. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take that. Thank you again. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm sure the audience have many questions, but um, before we get into our Q&A session, I suggest that we um, hear from our second speaker. We have Associate Professor Landing with us. She's a, at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Built Environment and um, convener of High Performance Architecture Research Center. And um, Lan has 80, over 80 years of experience in uh, different topics, including um, urban climate, as well as using different data sources, GIS, or, um, artificial intelligence, and so on, um, to address urban climate challenges. And we're very happy um, to have her with us today. Lan, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Elegan. So can you see that? Yes. Great. Um, I would like to share um, our experience about a research project uh, called the Microclimate and the Urban Heat Island Mitigation Design Support Tool. Um, so this is an interactive for online application. Um, the aim of this project is to provide governments and the building environment industries with a design support tool to inform urban policy development assessment related to building and urban interventions um, and uh, how to uh, cool um, streets and cities and decrease energy consumption and improve thermal comfort. Um, we have um, identified four, uh, in the original project, we have identified four exemplar precincts in Sydney and Western Sydney, and then uh, monitor and categorize the microclimate of the exemplar precincts. And uh, the uh, design support tool will provide, uh, actually, design support tool provides scenario analysis of uh, um, development alternatives and uh, mitigation options. So, for example, changes in build form and uh, building height, uh, facade materials, roof, and vegetation, and so on. And then predict the uh, um, urban heat island mitigation. Um, outcomes. So, for example, reduction in air temperature, reduction in surface temperature, uh, reduction in energy consumption, and so on. Uh, and the, the results will be used to inform urban policy and planning practices. Um, one component we plan to do, which is a post development assessment, but we couldn't because of the time uh, limitation. And this scenario analysis is was supported by integration of various models. So, for example, microclimate data model, uh, GIS, which cover vegetation data, um, land use data, uh, building information models cover uh, building main building components like a roof, facade, um, and uh, materials because that will impact urban heat. Um, urban information models include urban objects and properties like uh, uh, cool pavement, the materials as well, very important. Um, then the prediction and assessment models. Um, there are four layers we um, develop uh, our uh, design support tool platform and uh, integrated the various models. Uh, first end user layer, we use the system platform for graphic user interface, uh, provide interactive functions um, to engage with users like local governments or developers. And then assessment engine, uh, we use the both uh, third party simulation engine and also the neural network, uh, which provide a, a wide range of prediction of cooling intervention impact 
of development alternatives. Um, the next layer data storage, uh, we use the 3D CT database um, and also include, and also we have census data as well and urban uh, and heat maps. Um, for data interoperability, uh, we use uh, um, the city GML as core schema for uh, data interoperability um, and also building information models um, that uh, are were linked with city GML. Um, GIS data, uh, because we received the GIS data from New South Wales government, include land use data, zoning data, vegetation, and so on. This diagram shows uh, just an example, so that's city GML, so people, if you are familiar with. However, we um, have added uh, some um, objects or properties which are required for urban heat uh, impact analysis. For example, land use, um, says, uh, land use types, that's important, um, and also uh, uh, materials, the properties um, for city objects, like the uh, road surface uh, materials and the building roofs materials. So that's building uh, objects. So for the um, the uh, city objects that the road network uh, and also vegetation, uh, footpaths and so on. Um, this just a screenshot about one example uh, uh, precinct, uh, which is Paramount Civic Link Redevelopment. Uh, local government want to develop a new pedestrian paths, however, uh, they want to see the urban heat impact by uh, development alternatives. For example, the new buildings, the proposed buildings, if um, if high density, medium density, or medium uh, or low density, and the facade materials, um, and if cool roofs or green roofs, um, which could help uh, mitigate uh, the uh, urban heat and improve outdoor thermal comfort and including shading as well. And uh, uh, cool pavement for roads, private and uh, uh, public room um, and uh, parks, uh, trees and so on. So um, the design support to platform allows a government to test uh, development alternatives and uh, different urban heat mitigation options against the indicators, for example, air temperature reduction um, and the peak electricity demand reduction and so on. Um, and recently we have extended to um, more um, uh, neighborhoods and precincts, including um, Portland uh, City in Melbourne. Um, OK, so perhaps um, I stop here. Um, I would like to appreciate uh, our research team um, at the UNS Seminole. And this project was funded by CRC for Low Carbon Living. And uh, uh, we collaborated with 16 government and industry partners. And uh, thank you. And uh, also, I'm happy to answer questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Lam, for very impressive um, presentation. Um, I would like to open it now um, to the audience and see if you have questions um, from the audience that they would like to ask our panel. I think we can do that um, two ways, either um, unmuting and we can post the questions directly to the panel members or raising hand and putting it in a chat. So if not, I will start um, with a question I have to both panel um, members. And we've seen really great example of um, measurement projects that are focusing on different um, data sets coming from citizens using technology to gather more data and also a project that we've seen that relies more on the use of data sets and, and modeling to gather more information um, in the in the city. So the part that um, I'm, I would like us to talk more about is 
not only using these data sets and methodologies to gather knowledge, but also seeing how this is used in action. Um, and what, what we think um, these data sets and technologies are, are um, untapping potentials for us to then really seeing in action, like how cooling and warming in the cities are managed. So if we have um, stories to share regarding this specific examples of how either your citizen science or um, the modeling tool has been used, into, or we think that there are potential that this can, um, can be taken forward, we are happy uh, to, sh um, to hear from the panel members. Oh, I think you're mute, Priya. <laughs> So in, in, in our case, like what, what the biggest potential I would think is in using this data for energy simulations, because what uh, normally we use data uh, is from the weather, weather data, which is doesn't really represent the city center or if, if people are in a specifically um, vulnerable heat, vulnerable, vulnerable area, depending on their geographic location or the lack of vegetation. And uh, when you use data from the weather stations, it doesn't really represent um, the actual condition. Sometimes we, it can be three to four degree higher than the weather station data. So what we are trying to do is make uh, the data in such a format, which could be useful for energy simulations, depending on what kind of simulation people are using. And also look at uh, the, the thermal discomfort, uh, both indoor and outdoor. And based on that, people can actually see the heat vulnerability, even policymakers or local governments can um, understand the heat vulnerability and what kind of uh, mitigation potential for both outdoor area as well as the residential you know uh, in, in environment how various passive cooling technologies especially to address the extreme heat events yeah and i think that creates a really interesting link to what um lan was describing before where these mitigation strategies can then be assessed um specifically based on the location and then quantify how. So there are, there can be connections made with very fine scale local yeah. uh, measurements and what they can then um, integrate in a larger scale um, mitigation strategies. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then, yeah, your thoughts on this um, before we move sure. on to the questions. Sure, I agree with you both. Um, I just share one more. Um, slides can you see this yes okay so this is a, a, a ongoing project uh, we have just actually just finished that with uh city of Porfinip. um on the right so i would like to use the right component to answer your question um so they have um south melbourne structure plan so they want uh, the uh, cooling intervention impact analysis to inform their uh, structure plan and also update their plan. Um, there will be a new development areas. Um, how they can develop that uh, to help mitigate urban heat and uh, towards 2050, I think. Um, so this data, um, um, uh, uh, the, the data analysis and the decision support uh, really help them um, in terms of uh, these four areas. So it's about uh, uh, to support their redevelopment uh, of uh, the uh, local area and the planning recommendation like planning controls and the changes to urban design guidelines and also updated urban green infrastructure strategies. So I think in terms of actions and uh, our project outcomes, we strongly support um, the local government actions towards urban heat mitigation, not only for the recent years, but also for future, like 2030, 2050. Thank you. This is a wonderful example and, and specifically answer um, what I was hoping to see because this is this is where we can see the full cycle of the 
generating data sets, then using it uh, for um, either modeling or cer a certain assessment that can um, generate knowledge and then bringing that back to create actions and inform decision makings. Um, and uh, while we have another four minutes, I would again ask um, if you have any questions from the audience um, before we finish the um, session, I think now is a good time um, to raise your hand uh, before we miss this opportunity. Um, otherwise, I, I'm gonna ask a, a more practical uh, question for both speakers, and that's most specifically about um, the, the experience of working with a range of data sets that you have available to you, um, from um, availability and access to accuracy to even understanding of, of the whole process when you're communicating to this to citizens, when you're communicating with governments. Um, how, how is this journey for you and how has the experience been? Um, where are we now in 2020 in terms of using all these data that is available to us to really taking it um, forward to where we want to be in uh, managing the warming and cooling in our cities? Um, yeah, I think for me, the great uh, experience was uh, for people really understanding, you know, they are doing this um, measurement in a children's playground and they find suddenly, okay, this rubber rubber surface in the playground is the hottest surface, which was absolutely shocking to them. And even seeing that, okay, on a hot day, the temperature can go up to 70 degrees Celsius. And um, the most challenging part I would see is this interoperability of data. And you have this, you know, high number of data sets, but if you don't really pre-plan for that data sets, most of the things could be just rubbish. And um, how do you actually eliminate those error and have some kind of a auto correction system and compare that uh, with metadata and to be able to make it in a format which is usable for, for example, uh, building simulation or um, some other some other kind of modeling. It, it's very challenging because you you you. You can't really collect, you know, currently the census, uh, the microclimate citizen science census uh, for our project is only cal only doing temperature and humidity. Whereas, you know, if you really want to talk about the whole weather data sets, you want further um, data, which is sometimes quite difficult to collect because of, you know, the, the memory memory issue of the sensors and the capacity of the system to handle this data. But I think if you, it's really important to plan that in advance before you uh, really implement that uh, to the citizens. Or data, data sources that are perhaps more compatible yeah. in, in yeah. the way that they're documented and generated and yeah. shared. Um, Lan, do you have some yeah. thoughts that you would yeah. like to add? Thank you. I have two points. Uh, one is I think we need more engagement with local governments, in particular academic. <laughs> um, I think local governments have great data, uh, the digital data sets, and like uh, City of Port Phillip, we worked with them. They have great 3D models for whole cities and also other data sets. And the, the, the question is, how to make use of this data set. So that's why I think we need more engagement with local governments. And the second, uh, another thing we haven't looked at that, but that's important, I think, is about the trends, like the history, the past, what happened in the past, what now, and what is the future. So we look at the trends, then we provide um, our guidance or, or our suggestions to the governments or developers to uh, tackle the real world problem. So uh, in terms of, I mean, the time, time series, past and the, the now, the recent and the future. So how we, in particular, the urban development. So now the population grows and there's changes in cities, um, how we make data set to monitor the not only recent, uh, the past and predict for future. Thank you. What a great note to end this 
panel on. Um, so we, we are now at 10 a.m. Um, I'm sure we have more to discuss, but unfortunately we ran out of time. And um, I would just like to thank our panel speakers for being here today, sharing their insights um, from different projects and also experience. I hope um, this was helpful for many others um, working in this field or trying to get an insight on what can be done using a range of um, different methodologies and data sets available. Thanks again, and um, hope you have a good day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.